Okay, we are here today at the Tawny Town History Museum, located at 340 West East Baltimore Street in Tawny Town, and the date is March 10th, 2018. We're here with Luella Sabo Harner, and she's going to share with us her memories of Sobel's Inn. My name is Peggy Flegel Keeney, and I'm a volunteer here at the History Museum. The location of Sobel's Inn, is, which is going to be the subject of today, is on the west side of town. It's located on West Baltimore Street on the corner of Harney Road in West Baltimore. Large house there, and it actually has been there a long, long time. We don't know when the house was built, but um, um, it has been a farm there since the Revolutionary War days. So I'm going to tell a little bit about the past history of the farm before the Sobels bought it. They bought it in 1912, so prior to that, like I said, we're going back to the Revolutionary War times. And Rudolf Crabster and Amelia Crabster bought it, they have a record of it, in 1777. And it was about a hundred acre farm then. The family came from the Netherlands, and they did own the farm up into the 1800s was still in the Crabster family. And interestingly enough, they used it as a tavern and a boarding house. So I found that to be interesting since the, your grandparents decided to do the same thing. Back then, Harney Road was the main road to Gettysburg. So that was a good location, also a good location because the uh, road, Emmitsburg Road, was the main road to Emmitsburg and Pennsylvania. So it was a, a good location for them to have a tavern there. This information comes from Basil Crabster's papers, which he wrote. He was a professor of history at Gettysburg College, and he wrote um, about his family history. Probably around the 1970s or so, he wrote papers about this. He was the fourth great-grandson of Ruloff Crabster. And these papers are for anyone to look at and read that's interested. They're housed at the Historical Society of Carroll County in Westminster. So now we're up to the mid-1800s, and Dr. Samuel Swope, who was a physician here in town for 50 years, um, bought the property, he and his wife. So another important event happened near that time. July 1st, 1863, we're into Civil War times now. And the Union troops actually rested or stayed or camped, I don't know, I think the term they used was rested, on the Swope property. So I think maybe, it probably was across the road, maybe where Memorial Park is now. Yes. Probably in that field, they camped maybe overnight and before their march the next day to Gettysburg. So then they had the battle, and Dr. Swope went to Gettysburg and helped the wounded and the dying. So he was an important uh, figure in history, I think. Next we have the Swope family owned it up until 1900, so all the late, later 1800s, um, the Swope family was there. So 1900 to 1912, Ed Rheindahler owned it, and he was very uh, beneficial to Tawny Town. He had the Rheindahler Company Mill, which was located near the railroad. He also was the founder of the Bernie Trust Company Bank, and he had other businesses in town. So in 1912, then, we are up to the property being sold to George and Irene Ray Snyder Sobel. And I believe they had small children when they moved there. And the restaurant actually did not start until 1918. So this is 1912. Why do you think your grandparents started the restaurant? They wanted something to do with all the rooms that they had. There were eight on um, one level and six on the other. And, um, some of the farmhands lived in some of the rooms, and uh, they decided to do something with them, so they advertised in uh, newspapers in the Baltimore area. And as a result, they had people coming from 
the Baltimore and Washington area in order to uh, spend the night and so forth. And that, that seems to be how it got started. And then when people came to visit the people that were staying there, uh, they asked my grandmother and her family to, would they serve the meals? And so they were serving meals to the rumors or boarders and to their company, uh, th to their uh, company coming to visit. So from that point on, then they started with Sunday dinners in order to accommodate them and other people wanted to come to that knew them. So it just kind of picked up in that sort of way. Mm -hmm. But um, my grandparents had uh, six children. Um, my father, Norman, was the oldest and he was born in January the 19th in 1900. So he and, was only 12 when they moved there. Yes, yes he was. And uh, then came uh, uh, Earl Sobel, who lived to be 18, he drowned in a rowboat activity on the uh, Monocacy just across the Frederick County line. And then came my Uncle Raymond in 1905. <clears throat> he lived to be 40. He happened to have a car accident. He uh, apparently didn't make the turn coming down the same road along the Monocacy where my uh, other uncle, whom I didn't know, uh, was uh, killed. So, uh, and Uncle Raymond was 40 at the time, and I think he died in uh, 1946. Uh, then came another uh, child, Ernest, who died at birth, and then my Aunt Ethel, who thank goodness did live, and she uh, was born in 1910 and died in 99, 1999. Uh, then came another stillbirth, my uh, uh, Aunt Emma, and that, this was in 1913. So altogether, my grandparents had the six children. Only four actually made it. Um, with uh, Eventually, uh, my parents, well, when they married, a house was built across the street, uh, just two two driveways down from the main entrance to uh, our uh, Tony Town Memorial Park. And uh, my Uncle Raymond and his wife uh, built a house uh, right next to the park drive. And then my parents built first. It was back, I think, about 1926, uh, uh, possibly a little before that they built two dark, each built a dark brick house. Uh, my father had two daughters. My sister was born two years ahead of me. And Aunt Ruth and Uncle Raymond had three children, uh, George, Ed, and Lorraine. Uh, my sister was 50 when she died, uh, scuba diving in the waters off the coast of Mexico. She uh, became a hospital dietitian at Duke University Hospital and married a, well, he was at first a student and then a um, surgeon. And uh, six of them, uh, upon graduating and wanting to go into business, decided to move to Arizona. And, and they decided to go to the borders off the coast of Mexico, scuba dive, and seeing an unusually large moor eagle, she went oh, and grasped, and the water came in, and she drowned. Mm -hmm. But, um, and my uh, uh, brother in law, her husband, uh, just died about a year ago, a little, mm -hmm. little over a year ago. Um, with uh, Aunt Ruth and Uncle Raymond, they had three children, George, Ed, and Lorraine. And my sister and I and those three were as close as could be. Uh, we just, we, we practically lived in each other's houses. Um, my sister was two years older than I. Uh, George was about four months younger than me, and then Ed came along three years after that, and Lorraine about three to four years after that. So we just fit the age. Ann Ethel's children weren't in the area. She married a, a man, Uncle Eddie, who became a minister, and they lived in the Pennsylvania area. Several hours, so I think it was about three or four hour drive, but we went to visit every once in a while. But they weren't back here until, oh, many, many years after that. 
we just had a, a, a nice time when they were taking uh, what we call borders or rumors over the inn. Um, they got so many they couldn't find, didn't have room enough for all of them. So they asked my parents to take one or two. Uh, so they farmed out two of their bedrooms and my sister and I slept on piles of uh, rugs and blankets on the floor in the back part of the dining room. And um, then when they needed still more, they went over to Aunt Ruth and Uncle Raymond next door. And Lorraine slept on a cot then in her parents' bedroom. And uh, George and Ed were given the privilege of uh, uh, our, our back porches, our back, both back porches had a, of our houses had a roof on it. But ours had uh, poles up and a roof on top of that. Um, George and Ed didn't, but Uncle Raymond finished it off and made it into a room so that in the summertime, George and Ed would sleep in the room over the back porch. And so they were able to take in more. It was just, well, something you did. Well then, unfortunately for the rumors, or perhaps fortunately, I don't know, um, us five kids playing together, those that were staying there, now they didn't eat at our house, they still went over to the inn to eat, but uh, they would sit on the front porch and talk to us and so forth, and then when we were out back playing together at each other's houses and so forth, they'd uh, come around back and sit on the lawn chairs my family provided. And uh, we'd uh, entertain, well, then my father, the dear soul, uh, built a platform it was about that high off the ground, and it was painted dark green. I'd say it was six to eight feet square, and it was open on three sides. The back side behind the stage uh, had part of a wall, and it had a doorway opening that actually had a pointed frame up at the top that you could walk through this doorway. It didn't have a door on it but the rest of the back part, we could stand behind till we were ready to come out. We'd get on that thing and read poems, sing songs, do dances, <laughs> and they would, the, the upboarders would sit there and clap their hands for us. Well, of course, that made us feel good. And I recall every now and then, we'd be thrown pennies and nickels and so oh. forth. Uh, yeah. And I, it, it, was, it was just fun. Uh, but when it came to working time, now all the work that we did for our grandparents, <clears throat> we were never paid for it, uh, in dollars and cents. But we did, we learned a lot. Uh, and every Monday we could count on having uh, backs and necks fried chicken at our house maybe some leftover mashed potatoes or sweet potatoes or candied apples or some things like that. So every Monday was leftovers from Sobble's Inn and we all enjoyed it. Um, my uh, grandparents had us doing other things too, only because we wanted to, not because we were forced to, but uh, the field that we picked potatoes, um, the five of us, now Lorraine was much younger and uh, she didn't do as much of this, but she was there most of the time and saw what was going on. The Tata Field was across the road, uh, over here, across from the house? Uh, no, it, it would be right, right here. Hmm. Up in right this area. Here. Okay. This would be the Harney Road. Yes. You know. Um, and uh, when we picked potatoes, they, uh, they had hired help galore, they really did. And we'd fill the baskets and then the hired help would lift them up on the wagon or, you know. Uh, but when we came across small potatoes, as Lorraine still says, remember to, uh, George and Ed used to throw the small ones at us three girls, and uh -huh. I said, I sort of sure do. I mean, we had to pick them up anyhow and put them back in the basket. But that's one thing they liked to do. Um, Another thing that we did, um, we picked dandelions. Now that may sound funny, but my grandmother used them to make wine. And I can still see them sitting in those huge tubs with some moisture 
and these yellow dandelions, and they were just fermenting and so forth. But she used it in her uh, mince pies mm. and uh, fruit cake and things like that. Well, did they sell liquor to the restaurant no, goers? No, or we had coffee. They didn't serve this wine, the standing wine. Coffee, wine. water, and iced tea, yes. Okay. And uh, uh, a big part of this dining room was this additional building there, mm -hmm. which is now turned, ages ago, was turned into a regular full apartment. Um, some of the other things uh, out back here, uh, there was gardens going up the walk here. Uh, we helped with uh, all kinds of things in those gardens. I mean, all the food to, that they served. Um, you have a list of food? Yes. Um, it was a lot. They started out originally costing 75 cents, and by the time they were ready to close, I can still see Grandma standing there. We just can't charge three dollars. They were up to two seventy-five. Uh -huh. She and Uncle Raymond and, and my mother and Aunt Ruth were standing at the entrance to the small dining room talking about this. We're going to have to close. We just can't charge that much for a meal. This is what they were serving: fried chicken. All of this was all that you could eat, and they had uh, fried ham or chicken livers if you requested it. And for Thanksgiving and Christmas, they had turkey and dressing, too. But they also served mashed potatoes and gravy, candied sweet potatoes, candied apples, corn, peas, lima beans, asparagus, sliced tomatoes, coleslaw, cottage cheese, chow chow, chicken salad, fruit salad, celery, apple butter, strawberry preserves, rolls and butter, coffee and iced tea, angel food cake, marble cake with chocolate icing and black walnuts on top. And they had homemade ice cream of chocolate, vanilla, strawberry, and when peaches were in season, peach ice cream was mm. also served. Sounds wonderful. And all of those things had to be put on trays, you know, dipped up and put on trays and so forth. And I mean, it, it was just big trays. As a matter of fact, I still have a couple of trays. And one of their big pitchers, it looked like it might hold maybe two gallons of water. And they had little glass pitchers that, uh, for the small tables, uh, they could just fill that with water and put it on the table for the people to help themselves to, you know. Uh, and on the table, they used cloth, uh, tablecloths, uh, in the beginning until they got into such a business. Then they used uh, uh, plastic, but it was like an engraved uh, plastic uh, material with uh, uh, felt backing. And then we had to wash them each time. The, the patrons changed, you know, the different patrons came to the table. But uh, there were just, well, so many of the people kept coming back and coming back that they eventually got to going to the same waitress, mm -hmm. you know. They had their favorites. <laughs> Apparently so. I can't tell you how old my sister and I were when we started uh, waitressing in the uh, dining room. But uh, we were busy in the kitchen until we got became old enough to work in the dining room. Um, and in the kitchen, they had three cold storage rooms. Um, the wall between the kitchen and the dining room had uh, little uh, sliding doors that went up uh, that you could, uh, oh, I don't know, maybe about this square, a little bit wider, I guess, uh, that you could raise the door and talk to them and say, I need this or I need that. Yeah. Uh, one of them went right into the dishwasher, which was like it was on a, uh, a, a ramp, and it went up and they cleaned off the dishes and people on the other side cleaned off the dishes and then put them on these racks and sent them through this moving dishwasher rack and they came out the other end. And dear Lorraine, who was the youngest of us all, um, she was so short that she had to, she was drying the silverware on days that we were real busy. The other things could self-dry because they were so hot and everything. And the silverware could too, but not fast enough. 
and it was so hot that Lorraine couldn't handle it, so she'd grab them with one towel and dry them off with another towel and put them on a tray or a, a, a container to uh, send them over to the dining room people to use. And I mean, I can still see her standing on that stool, just this little kid <laughs> leaning over to get them and so forth. Mm. Um, the other windows, we could get uh, regular dishes, not just silverware. Um, if we had some hot food that we needed to refill, that would come out of another opening. And then there was a section where the um, ice cream was stored. It was made out in one part of the uh, a shed going up here uh, and uh, then brought in in large tall cans like that and put in a, a refrigerated container open to the dining room and we could dip the ice cream whatever kind you know they chose to use uh, and then the last one was the cold storage room where the George and Mel would frame they lived in Green um, though at the time uh, they were oh, maybe three, two, two to four years older than my sister and I, but we were, we knew them, you know, they were family friends and everything. So, uh, and they were in a cold storage room that had wooden racks on each side when you went in from the kitchen. It was full length door, of course. Uh, and they worked in there to dip up what we needed. And before we were old enough to work in the dining room, um, whoever worked in there, uh, we had to take them dishes. There were a lot of glass dishes being used, of course, for that area. It was just, uh, well, it was fascinating. And I guess they cooked on an old wood stove? Well, the, the um, chickens were fried in an uh, old wooden cast iron, old cast iron stove. And um, um, they used cast iron, big black cast iron frying pans like that in lard. Uh, and uh, the, the Mother's Day Sunday that we had a thousand people, we didn't know until we counted at the end, or they counted at the end of the day, but uh, the, the stoves were at the Gettysburg end of the kitchen, <laughs> and uh, they got so hot that the wood that was stored on the other side of the wall to use in the stoves started smoldering mm. and caught on fire. Oh my. But they put it out and everybody kept on going. Kept going. <laughs> it was just it was just fascinating. It really was. Now you told us that some about they grew a lot of vegetables in the gardens. They drew and grew what about the animals? Everything that they could for themselves. That was the least expensive and it was right there and they had a lot of helpers. Uh, some of them even lived at the end. Uh, I can recall uh, when this house was built. No, excuse me. This house was built. Now my grandparents owned those two houses too. But this house was built for one of their workers. And the layout of that house is exactly the layout of the brick house that I was born in ages ago. Mm -hmm. um, they raised their own chickens. Um, let's see. This was the chicken house here. Cement block at the bottom, wood at the top, and they raised hogs down there. That was just removed last year by the uh, uh, Ann Eccles uh, daughter's family. Um, and uh, of course they butchered the hogs, and upstairs they butchered the chickens. And George, Ed, and eventually Lorraine, of course my sister, my mother, and Aunt Ruth, and Uncle Raymond, all assisted along with other people, the helpers and so forth, in um, killing the chickens. And uh, I can recall George was so tickled when he was considered old enough, and Uncle Raymond would get a chicken out of a crate and hold it for him, and he'd take it and hold it so that his neck was on a chopping block, and then George would chop it and the neck would fall down, mm -hmm. and he put the chicken, wiggling and everything else, in a tall bushel basket. Not the short round, but the tall. And it would flop and flop until it was gone. And then 
either Uncle Raymond or one of the hired helpers would um, put it against a machine that had thick rubber fingers and rotate it, and that would help to remove the feathers. Mm -hmm. and then someone else would have to finish it up. Mm -hmm. And uh, it would be cut open so that the insides could come out. And in the beginning, I thought it was fantastic. I was first in line to do something. But that was gizzard patrol. And I had to clean out the gizzard, cut it open. And I did, you know, but I was so tickled when I was considered old enough and good enough that I could actually cut out the wings. And what you did, it was just like a conveyor belt. Uh, each person did one thing and passed the chicken along to the next. And you put your item on a tray in front of you, or in a bowl in front of you, which is what I did with the gizzards. And then when I was finally able to cut the uh, chicken wings off, I could do that and put them in. You were, and pro you were promoted. I was definitely promoted. You have no idea how that made me feel. Stupid situation as it was, I thought it was great that I was considered good enough to go to the next item. But my mother and my Aunt Ruth and, of course, a lot of helpers, and we all just, that was something we did. Mm -hmm. So, um, Did you have fruit trees? You and. They, your own fruit? They had some, but not nearly what they needed, of course. Uh, but they did have a lot. If we needed a particular kind of apple uh, for the candy apples. Uh, your Imperial were the ones that I think my grandparents used. Um, I and did you make applesauce? Made, made applesauce and, of course, candied apples. And they had a a piece of equipment that would clamp onto the tables, the big tables they had it back in the kitchen. And uh, it had a handle on it, and it had a, a, a part that would have like teeth that you'd stick the apple on, and then turn, and put the blade against it, and then turn, and it would peel the apple. Mm -hmm. And then when you'd take it off and put it in a bowl, and someone else would take it and cut it into the chunks that it was needed, you know. Uh, and they, the uh, candied apples and candied sweet potatoes, were most often cooked by Maggie Aller, who was a good old standard, delightful hard worker, um, on a gas stove in an offside section of the kitchen. It was along with burners on top. I don't know, possibly three or four burners in a length and these big pans would sit there. Very little water in the ones that did the candy apples, but lots of butter, of course. And, uh, of course, sugar galore, I mean, you know, <laughs> all that. But uh, it came out beautifully. We, we had a good time with it, so. And with the pigs that they grew, they had the hams. Yes. And yeah. then the lard. Mm -hmm. Well, the they, lard. Had a, they had a smokehouse. In the back of the building, yeah, it would have been out in this area someplace. It's no longer there, of course, but it was a, well, larger than an individual car garage. Uh, and half of it was a smokehouse part. And you go in and there would be these hams and so forth hanging from the uh, rafters, mm -hmm. you know, smoking it everything, and then the other half was used as a laundry room and for storage of other things. Uh, Grandma, of course, did her, well, I, she and the help of the laundry, and um, of course, sheets and everything had to be washed, uh, and they were hung on the line, and in the back of the uh, house here, there are, and the walks are still there, I don't know if you can even see, yes, you can, and there are clotheslines on each side, and uh, those walks were also handy when you were walking down through the garden to pick things, you know, the tomatoes or whatever. They just were handy. Now, people that stayed there overnight or for the week or something, um, they had someone else. Well, as a matter of fact, we were fortunate that uh, Miss Carrie Winters and her our parents, Herbert, Mr. and Mrs. Herbert Winters, that lived about, uh, oh, a half a dozen houses up the street almost across where were the um, uh, Dean Automotive's uh, garages mm -hmm. now. Uh, they did uh, the laundry. They came down and picked it up from the people and then t took it home and did it and brought it back to them. All members of our Sobel family 
uh, went to the Trinity Lutheran Church, which still exists and I still go to here in Tony Town. And uh, among other things, we had uh, uh, a Sunday school superintendent and uh, many of the times uh, we would meet in the large Sunday school room and with the adults and the smaller Sunday school rooms off to the uh, side. We'd meet in groups around the room and so forth. But, uh, and once in a while from the pulpit upstairs, we would be told about how terrible it was to work on Sunday. Oh my. And unfortunately, everybody knew that Sobel's End was working on Sunday. And this man, uh, the farmhouse, had a beautiful big brick farmhouse outside of Tony Town. And uh, all too often, when he began his introduction or was talking before teachers went to their, divided into their individual groups in this big room, he would mention that fact. And the irony of it is, uh, I can't tell you exactly when, it wasn't right away, of course, but before the inn closed, the man had three very lovely daughters. And two of them came to work at Sobel's Inn on Sunday. And it was just the irony of the whole thing that the man who really did the most talking about this working on Sunday uh, ended up with his daughters there. Uh, we all wore, well, uniforms. We had dresses made by uh, a lady over in um, Kemar, and we'd go over to be fitted and so forth. All the waitresses? So, all the waitresses uh, had those. Uh, the uh, fellows that worked there didn't uh, have anything special, but they always looked nice. And thank goodness we had them to carry our heavier trays and help to clear tables and things like that. But it was just, I, I can still see my uh, Uncle Raymond and my mother and aunt and uh, another one or so standing by that door near the front of the house saying that we simply can't go on to charge this much money. Well, I think that this porch is so beautiful. It's a big porch that I think your grandparents added to it. Well, they had small porch roof over each doorway, but they didn't like that. And of course, with people, there were three of those, three of those. So they decided to make it a porch that covered two sides: mm -hmm. the uh, 140 root side and the Harney Road side. And would you believe, just last year. Um, among other times, of course, but Anne Ethel's uh, daughter, who well, she's no longer existing, but uh, uh, Sandra died a couple years ago from Parkinson's, uh, but her husband and family still tended the grounds, and they had everything gone over and replaced the roof and did all this stuff wherever they needed, and it looks like the same identical place. They made a point of returning everything to the order it was, oh, and, and wonderful. so it looks just like it did. Oh, Same wow. tone of green, everything. The green. only thing, well, the porch was uh, tiled years and years ago, you know, but it, and they have um, automatic lights that at night, if you're walking on the porch, they turn on in sections mm. on the ceiling, you know, right. and it, it's just fascinating how everything's been updated. Very and nice. uh, this house, was built by Anna from my uncle uh, uh, Eddie uh, when they retired from the ministry and moved there. And of course, they still uh, Sandra's family still owns that too. But it's just well, uh, it's fascinating. Well, speaking of the big porch, I can just imagine how nice that would have been for guests who uh, came in the summer to sit out there. Oh, they did. They and, did. And do you remember some of the? Special guests, any special guests that you remember that stayed there? Well, Miss Carrie and Miss Rose were the main ones only because of the imprint that they gave on me. And there were others, but it may be the 89 year old brain, I can't recall specific names other than those two, you know. But, uh, uh, and, and of course, they sat on the lawn too. As a matter of fact, uh, I had two of their lawn chairs until about uh, oh, four or five years ago, I guess. I 
no longer since I'm alone. My husband's been dead for uh, 20, 29 years in July. Uh, and I don't like to sit out on the side porch right of my house by myself, so I don't use them. And I gave them to uh, my, uh, one to my daughter and one to my son. And uh, so they use them. But they were metal chairs with arm rests, mm -hmm. and usually they were green. As a matter of fact, there used to be one up on the, uh, what used to be the Reformed Church Parsonage where Reverend Brady lived years ago when he was uh, minister over at the Reformed Church. Uh, and I was going to get up enough courage to go up and ask if they wanted to sell it, but they, the time I thought about it and actually did something, they had moved and took the chairs with them. Apparently. Mm -hmm. But uh, they were very, very comfortable, and the people would carry them off the porch if they wanted to sit out in the open. Otherwise, they would line the porch, and Uncle Raymond would stick his head out the door and say, uh, the uh, uh, sleep off family, or this family, or, you know, party of two, party of four. Oh, they were waiting to get in. Yes, yes. Uh -huh. A they, waiting line. They, they had gone in and made, you know, paid for their reservations and everything, mm -hmm. and then when the tables were ready, they'd be called in. So it was... And do you have any stories about the uh, ladies that stay, came and stayed for a while in the summer? A story about that was a re, uh, some the teachers came up in the summer and stayed? Well, the uh, Miss Carey and Miss Rose were retired school teachers from the Baltimore area. And they just, well, they were nice. Um, I don't the, know. The way one of them was dressed? Oh. <laughs> the way she was dressed when I took mail to her from one evening. Well, I, we, those were chores we did as little kids, you know. And when she opened that door, I knocked on the door and I said, Miss Carrie, mail. She opened the door and she was in this long white nightgown with um, ruffles around the neck, long sleeves with ruffles, and a white cap with ruffles around. And she had reddish hair. It was very pretty. It was thin. I mean, it wasn't bushy or anything. And uh, she kept her hand on the doorknob and stuck her other hand out to get the mail. And she said, thank you. And I, it was such a shock the first time I saw her. After that, I expected it. And that's the way she looked, unless I was able to go earlier, whenever my grandmother had time to sort out the mail for whomever was to get it, you know. And now Miss Rose was dressed very much the same way, but she never had the cap on that I saw. And uh, she had so much dark black hair that I, looking back now all these years, I'm wondering if maybe it was a kind of wig. Mm. The, the way it seemed, I don't know. I mean, you know, I certainly didn't know at the time or didn't think about it then. But, uh, but no, there, there, there were people um, that well, husband and wife, I can recall. I can't recall the name. But they even asked to come to our house to stay because of us. Oh. Because George and Lorraine and my sister and I, we just played together at each other's houses as if we lived in those houses, you know. They came because together. of the entertainment. Well, <laughs> apparently so. But uh, it, it was fascinating. Uh, do you have any other memories that, that uh, you think you might have? not told us today? Well, if not, did, my, my next question will be, why do you think your grandparents uh, decided to close the inn? It was 1943, mm -hmm. so we're talking yes. war times. Uh, my grandfather died in uh, 47. So he only lived four years after they closed. My grandmother lived until uh, 54. So they were getting older. Oh, yes. And that, that, that was also part of the reason of not wanting to raise the cost of the meal. Um, and, and I can still see Grandpa standing there. He frequently kept one hand in his pocket for some reason or other. I mean, I could, that's just the way he was. But uh, it, it, it took. It took my grandmother a while. Uh, she, of course, she was very lonely losing my grandfather. And my father used to walk over almost every evening just to visit for a few minutes, and then walk back, just just checking on grandma. 
She stayed there until she yes. died in the house. She had a big old leather chair that my grandfather used to use. Um, the, the room that was right inside the very front door, what was on the other side of the over on this side, the Harney Road side. Um, he had a big old leather chair that he used to sit in and look out the window toward the toward, toward, toward town. And uh, she took up that uh, position when mm -hmm. my grandfather died. And uh, when, when you rode by, those of us who knew the situation, we'd go slow enough and we'd see Grandma in there, you know. But then she got up and she did her things, you know, but uh, it, it was... So probably a combination of the food prices going up and war times and, the and their age, age yes, uh, yes. caused them to close in 1943. Mm -hmm. So they really were open for 25 years. Yes, so yes. that was a long yes. time. And uh, long hours, I'm uh, sure. George and uh, my sister and I were in high school at the time, and Ed and Lorraine were in elementary school. Okay. And uh, I mean, it, it was just different. But, uh, I, I can still see us playing together in the grassy area between our two houses. We were just like one family in each house, you know what I mean? And mm -hmm. That's just the way it was at the time. Well, we, your uh, parents' names were Norma, Norman, Norman and, and, Buell. and Buell. Shoemaker Sorrow. Oh, mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. We should say their names. And um, also, your grandparents and your parents and the whole family did a lot for the Tawny Town community. And one of the biggest things, maybe, was um, they sold probably about 40 acres off for, which is on the uh, other, across the road, mm -hmm. for the Memorial Park, mm -hmm. which has been enjoyed now for generations. Yes, of, yes, it's a uh, wonderful park for use for ball games and picnics. Well, in the back of my house property, the other side of my split rail fence is Tony Town Memorial Park. Mm -hmm. So that whole section did belong to the Sawtell Farm. Mm -hmm. So they sold it all. We could go it. clear up to where Dean's Automotive Garage is now, and sled down the hill. Oh, that sounds great. When there great. was enough snow, we could do that. Uh huh. And that, that sounds that was great. All sold off to the building. So many people have enjoyed that park that came off the Sawtell Farm. The yes. uh, park was dedicated in 1953, mm -hmm. and actually. <clears throat> We think that this picture, <coughs> excuse me, this picture probably was in the 1950s. Oh, I suppose it was. Yes. And maybe around 19, early 1950s is, is the age of this picture. So actually, when this picture was taken, it really wasn't in any longer, but it hadn't changed much. No. Still, no, but it really hadn't. The, uh, your family owned the opera house and mm -hmm. took care of that for some years. Um, your family was active in community groups such as the Lions Club, I think, and yes, church. Yes. <clears throat> so they did um, really give a lot back to well, the, the community. The Kiwanis Club did start to meet there on Wednesdays. At the end. Uh -huh. The Lions Club hadn't been formed then yet, but uh, they did. And in the early 40s, maybe, before it closed? Yes. In oh, yes. Maybe 30s. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this has been wonderful, Luella, and we certainly thank you for coming and sharing oh, well, all your memories. It was yeah. just a fun way to grow up. And Sounds like it. I, I mean, people have said, that, well, didn't you get paid? We were paid in just being there. Enjoyed it. And to grow up with the three cousins next door, and Lorraine and I are still, of course, alive. Um, and in Ann Ethel's family, she has uh, Ronnie, I think, is in the Annapolis area. I have heard her talk to him for many years. And Judy, I'm not sure, I think maybe in the New Jersey area, but there again, I'm not sure. But it's just been, well, can't complain. It's been a wonderful life so far. Well, we thank you for sharing it with us today. Thank you for having me.